Mm. Um, welcome back. We will now resume the proceedings. The team for this session is Enterprise True Innovation. We have already referred to SMEs as drivers of the European economy and job creation. Um, so to become successful, SMEs need access to research and in innovation funding. And Horizon 2020 will provide greater access to such funding for SMEs. Indeed, this is a key provision of Horizon 2020. I would like to welcome our, our three speakers for this session. Uh, Mr. Wolfgang Borscher, Deputy Director General for Research and Innovation, who will speak on Horizon 2020, uh, an opportunity for European SMEs. And uh, having spent uh, dinner time with him last night, I can, I can certainly say he has plenty to say and plenty of experience to share with us. Uh, I'm glad that he's, he's working with the Commission. Uh, Dr. Melda Lampkin, Director of the National Support Network for Framework Programme 7, Enterprise Ireland, speaking on access to research funding, um, Ireland's experience, and Dr. Melda's uh, views on that and experience to share with us as well. Uh, and our third speaker is Dr. Mazar Barry, uh, co founder and Chief Technology Officer, Solar Print Irish SME, who will discuss the importance of research funding to his business. And, um, Dr. Barry is another uh, example of, a, of an Irish success story when it comes to an SME, so it's great to have him here as well. Um, so can I now call on uh, Mr. Borcher to, to say a few words. Chair, uh, members of Parliament, uh, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. I've been asked to give you our uh, <coughs> policy regarding SME involvement in the next uh, framework program for research and innovation, Horizon 2020. Before doing so, I would like to draw your attention and recall the importance of research and innovation funding for jobs and growth in general in a highly competitive globalized world. And <coughs> just have a look at this slide. It shows that there is a clear correlation between research and innovation spending and growth and jobs on the other hand. This picture here shows that those member states who over the last years have spent considerable amounts in research and innovation are also those member states who have got out of the crisis the best. So research and innovation spending is crucial for creating jobs and growth. But it's also crucial to address the societal challenges in which, which we are facing. You have heard that the population will grow by 50% by 2050, and it will not only grow, but the average life expectation, at least in Europe, will considerably increase. We need more food, according to assessments, 70% by 2050. We need more energy, 100% by 2050, and all these objectives we should achieve without increasing the temperature by more than 2%. So to deliver towards these societal challenges requires research, but it's also an opportunity to ensure new technologies which in turn will provide jobs and growth. So if there is broad agreement that research and innovation funding is key for jobs and growth on the one hand, and to solve our societal challenges on the other hand, why then these developments? This picture here shows you the uh, <coughs> part of the research and innovation spending of the different parts of the world. And it shows a kind of scaring development. It shows that Europe, over the last 15 years, or the part of Europe in the worldwide uh, <coughs> contribution to research and innovation has decreased from almost 30% down to 22%. And at the same time, other parts of the world have considerably increased their research and innovation spending. Uh, what are the causes for this? Certainly, public spending in Europe is quite comparable to other parts of the world, but it's in particular research and innovation expenditure from the private partners, from industry, that shows a much worse uh, commitment from industry in Europe compared to other parts of the world. Uh, now one could argue this is only about research and innovation funding, and there are no consequences related to this. But if you see this picture here, 
It also shows that it's not only about research and innovation funding, it's also about the results of research and innovation funding. And this slide here clearly indicates that those parts of the world where, which have an increasing research and innovation expenditure are also those who have much higher dynamic in terms of new patents. So I think having research and innovation funding is not innocent, but it really ensures that new products, new services uh, are delivered on the market. So <clears throat> how is the situation for the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in Europe? I think we have already heard this morning that SMEs constitute the backbone of the European economy for many reasons. But these European SMEs are under pressure. The SME in the EU as a whole continue to struggle to recover to pre-crisis levels of value added and employment. And when it comes to SMEs and research and innovation funding, you will see that in the EU there are almost 46,000 SMEs which are active in high-tech manufacturing and more than 4.3 million SMEs offering knowledge-intensive services, together accounting for 20%, 21% of all SMEs. These SMEs are quite successful. They include producing pharmaceutical products, electronics, or legal and accounting services, as well as scientific R&D and creative industries. There is one conclusion. SMEs that are active in the so-called high-tech and knowledge-intensive industry show a particularly strong performance in terms of productivity and employment, as well as gross value-added growth. Now, <clears throat> what are the weaknesses uh, of the uh, research and innovation landscapes regarding the SMEs in Europe? Compared to other parts of the world, the EU has fewer young leading innovators, jollies, than the USA. Jollies are 20% of EU leading innovators, whereas it's more than 50% in the United States. Jollies are 7% of total EU leading firm R&D expenditure compared to 35% in the United States. So <clears throat> there are deficiencies regarding research and innovation spending in Europe, also in the areas of high-tech uh, business. Now, the European Commission already, together with the Member States and the European Parliament, already in the seventh framework program has insisted that the framework conditions are favorable for the participation of SMEs. And if you look at these figures, I think they are promising because there was a target of 15% of SME participation in framework program seven, and we are today at the level of more than 16.3%, and in total, in total amounts, probably we will, have, we will spend more than 6 billion euros for SME funding in FP7. If you look at the details, it also indicates that we have considerably increased SME participation in the last two years, and this is certainly due to our uh, uh, Commissioner Gagan Queen, who really insisted when she took over office that SME participation is a key element for successful FP7 uh, research program. And the figures here clearly show that in particular in the last two years, this uh, participation of SME is increased due to ring-fenced and dedicated measures which were uh, directly addressed to SMEs. That's the situation under FP7. Now, what is in for small and medium-sized enterprises under Horizon 2020? As you know, the Commission, as part of the next uh, multi-financial framework, has also proposed a budget for research and innovation funding. Our proposal was 80 billion. However, unfortunately, this proposal has not been retained by the European Council. According to our calculation, the amounts now available for research and innovation are about 70 billion euros, but this is still an increase of almost 30 percent compared to the last framework program. But these figures are not yet decided, since, as you know, the European Parliament and the, minister, the Council of Ministers, the European Council, is still in the context of 
ne uh, negotiating in the context of the trilogue. What do we want to achieve with this uh, Horizon 2020 research framework program? It's on the one hand a response to the economic crisis to invest in future jobs and growth because as I've indicated, research and innovation funding is crucial for jobs and growth. It should address and we should not neglect this aspect. It's not only about jobs and growth, but it's also about addressing people's concerns about their livelihoods, safety and environment. And this brings me back to the question of societal challenges, which we are all facing also as individuals. And finally, one purpose of this Horizon 2020 is to strengthen the EU global position in research, innovation and technology. So, <clears throat> why are we optimistic that we will do it even better than under Framework Program 7? Because we consider that this new research and innovation framework program really constitutes a break with the past in many respects. Firstly, there will be a single program bringing together all research and innovation related funding in the European Union. And linked to this question is that for the first time we have a funding instrument that couples research and innovation together. I think this morning we have heard that one of the key deficiencies of Europe in terms of research and innovation is that we are quite strong in terms of uh, scientific uh, uh, research, basic research, but we are weaker when it comes to bring new products, new services on the market. So it's about commercialization of research products, of research results, which is one of the key issues we want to address in the new framework program and which should deliver opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprises and for industry, because we want that research results are brought to the market in terms of producing new products, services, processes. Another element I have already indicated is that there is a clear focus on societal challenges. And the last point, and which is a key point for small and medium-sized enterprises, that has also been mentioned this morning, is a simplifies, simplified access to the next uh, research and innovation funding program, because as it was pointed out, you cannot be innovative if you have to fight red tape. So these are the key main elements for the next uh, framework program. This framework program has three uh, pillars. One is excellent science, which is, as it has been indicated this morning, if you want the basic research part, which covers the European Research Council, Marie Curie. Then you have industrial leadership, where the industry, including SMEs, should set the research agenda, and finally the societal challenges. These are the three building blocks for the next framework program. Now, what is concretely in for SMEs? The first point worth mentioning is that compared to framework program seven, the target as negotiations stand at this moment has even been increased compared to FP7. The target for SME participation following the discussions with the uh, Council and the European Parliament. Uh, we are talking now about 20% of the combined amounts under leadership and societal challenges that should be dedicated to uh, small and medium-sized enterprise funding in Horizon 2020. There will be simplified access for all, particularly for SMEs. I will come back on this issue in a moment. And there will be dedicated instruments for SMEs, in particular new small and medium-sized enterprise instruments. We will continue with Eurostar, which is already part of Framework Program 7. We will foresee particular measures for access to risk finance. Uh, SMEs should also, be, uh, should also profit considerable from the so-called public-private partnerships which we are funding, the so-called joint technology initiatives, and I think the lion's part of SME funding as today will still take place in the framework of regular collaborative research project. 
This is the, the standard uh, uh, funding which we have. You know, we provide calls every year and the most excellent uh, projects from different member states, at least, at least three member states are chosen. And last point, we foresee a kind of generous, uh, simp uh, generous funding model. Now, what are the simplification elements? And I think that is our attempt to fight uh, uh, complexity and bureaucracy. We have proposed a single set of simple, coherent and participation rules for all types of participants, including industry, SME, universities. Since our, our research projects are always multi-partners, and amongst these multi-partners, there are different uh, participants like universities, research organizations, industry and SME, there is a real potential for simplification if you have only one funding rate, because you do not need any longer to distinguish, are you a, are you a SME, are you industry? This distinction might seem simple to you, but today uh, SME is not necessarily the shoemaker at the corner or the plumber. To be a SME in a globalized world or to find out and to validate whether somebody constitutes a SME is quite burdensome today and something that has been conceived as favorable for SMEs, a higher funding rate, turns out to be an advantage because before I can provide this higher funding right uh, level, I have to be sure that he is a SME and this takes often weeks and often months, which then leads to complaints. So this is why we propose one funding rate for all participants in our framework program. We propose broader acceptance of participants' accounting practices for direct costs. All this should also lead to reduce to time to grant, which is a key question for the research community because as my colleague has just pointed out, you have a good idea and you need the money quickly to start your work. So reduction of time to grant is a key issue. And finally, and this is the research community does not like this too much because they like very much trust-based funding. They like trust-based funding based on their blue eyes, brown eyes, whatever you want. But as public authorities, you still have to ensure that the money is well spent and that uh, gives a different perspective on, on funding to a certain extent. But still, I think we are optimistic that we can also deliver in this respect. So just uh, a last word on this new SME instrument that we uh, propose under Horizon 2020. We have the classical cooperative calls, we have Eurostars, but then we have really new the Horizon 2020 SME instrument, which is targeted to business innovation motivated SMEs. And the idea is to distinguish between three phases, concept and feasibility assessment, in a second phase, demonstration, market replication, R&D, and finally commercialization. And this again <coughs> shows our commitment to get more out from research, to get real new products, new services out of research in order to overcome one of the major deficiencies of the European research landscape compared to our competitors. Here again, um, some main features of this uh, new SME instrument that should also help us to deliver more innovation in the context of Horizon 2020. So this was by and large the main uh, element of what we will foresee for SMEs under Horizon 2020. But I think it's important that in all these discussions, and you are best placed as national uh, parliaments, as members of national parliaments, to be aware of the importance of research and innovation spending for our competitiveness. The world continues to turn and it turns quicker and quicker and research and innovation spending in general, but also for SMEs, becomes crucial if we want to maintain our leading role in the world economy. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Burchard. Um, I can now call on Dr. Imelda Lamkin. Um,
the micro stitch. Thanks, William, Damien, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, what I wanted to do was give you a feeling for uh, a country like Ireland, uh, a national perspective on European funding. So a little bit about what we've achieved, a little bit about how we approach the framework programme, and just a feeling for the scale of what we've achieved to date. And for us in Ireland, it's a real success story. So I suppose just to uh, start, uh, to give you a feeling for what we've achieved to date, um, we've had more than 1,500 successful applicants uh, over the term of FP7. And I suppose in a country like Ireland, that ranges from everything from the individual young researcher sitting in a university through to much larger use of the programme, uh, use of the programme by our university research centres, use of the programme by our small medium enterprises, and right up to our multinational corporations who are really doing their mainstream business with other multinational corporations across Europe. And they're very much doing that as part of their normal everyday business opportunities. Again, to give you a feeling for that scale, uh, we've just about passed the 500 million euro mark uh, in FP7. And a very interesting point for us in Ireland is that that figure is now over double the figure that we would have seen during the previous programme, FP6. And so that gives you a feeling for how a country like Ireland has turned to re-look at the programme and to use it in a much bigger manner than before. We're currently averaging about 100 million euros per year, and that's a very healthy addition to the system at a time when our country has gone through a severe economic crisis. It becomes even more significant that we have this funding coming into the country. A very interesting point, and I think in keeping with some of Wolfgang's uh, remarks earlier, our companies have drawn down four times the amount of funding that we saw companies uh, drawing down under the previous programme. And again, that's a very interesting uh, finding for us in Ireland. It's partly, I think, a response to what we've seen in terms of the economic crisis, but it's partly due to the simplification that has already occurred at the European Commission side during FP7. So while we often hear this question of SMEs, it's too difficult, they're not able to use the programme effectively, here we can show you a portfolio of SMEs who are capable of using the programme and who we hope will go on to bigger and better things under the new programme, Horizon 2020. I suppose the other point about our companies here in Ireland, 78% of that funding is going to small medium enterprises. So again, a very interesting perspective from one country. So a couple of snapshots, just to give you a feeling for the types of activity, what's being achieved in Ireland. I suppose the first one, uh, I wanted to just give an indication that a lot of the framework program funding is funding research jobs and I think at a time when everybody is working to a jobs agenda of course this is a key element and that was just a snapshot of one of our national institutes the Tyndall Institute winning a bunch of new uh, research jobs under one particular call and all in very high-tech areas uh, nano telecommunications medical devices etc etc Another snapshot, uh, a company like Intel uh, Corporation based in Ireland, a very big user in our context here locally of the framework programme. And here's a very interesting example of a multinational doing the day-to-day -day business with other multinationals around Europe and establishing those relationships. But very importantly for Ireland, they're also bringing in our academic partners, our research institutes and our small medium enterprises. So here's a way to use that very interesting environment of industry, large and small, with our academic institutes and research institutions coming together to use the framework programme at a bigger scale. 
Another example to give you uh, our Irish Research Council using the Marie Curie co-fund. And that's a very interesting one for us. It's just to show you it's not all about academics using the programme, companies using the programme. It's about our government departments and government research funding agencies using the programme in a much more intelligent way as well. And in this particular case, our research council funding 50 international research fellowships very significant in the Irish landscape, where otherwise the 50 research fellows would each have applied to the framework programme individually. So how can we do it at scale and have larger hits in the programme? And I suppose the one at the bottom I just gave to give an idea of the use of the European <coughs> Research Council. And this is the highest level research excellent academics, primarily uh, in our country. But I suppose I gave an example here, a snapshot, just to show you that it's not all about science for a country like Ireland. It's about social science, uh, socio-economic science and humanities as well. Uh, and it's about the, the international standing of the research uh, community that we have in the country. So behind uh, that type of a picture of a vibrant use of the programme, we have a national support network in Ireland and it's the job of the network to help all participants to use that programme. And for us, that network is uh, a resource from every major national research funding organisation in the country whose job it is to also leverage the national investment through the Europe European Framework Programme. And that just gives a feeling for who we have in it. It's our uh, funding organisations. But to give you a feeling for the influence, the effect of a system like that, I have a, just a schematic here which shows you that in the column on the right, when our national contact points, the members of our national support network, work in a very detailed manner with our applicants, we increase our success rate in the programme from about the EU average, 22%, up to about a success rate of one in three. So a very big leap in terms of the success rates you can achieve by putting a very strong support system in place. And here in Ireland, it's resourced heavily. Uh, it has a commitment across all government departments and across all research funding organisations, as I've stated. In terms of what we do, uh, we essentially say to people that from the first day they hear of the programme and say, what is FP7? Right through their project proposal, preparation stage, through to their negotiation, through to getting up and running with that project, we'll assist them, uh, hand-holding them through that process. And literally from you know, the application to a particular call, through the phases where there are no calls appropriate, but we'd like to influence next year's work programmes, for example, to influence the agenda in Brussels, right through to making people feel at home in Brussels, where, for example, we host meetings, we provide meeting rooms, we contact the, the relevant people in the Commission, uh, we showcase new developments, new research investments, for example, in Brussels. So all of that strategic positioning of Ireland uh, happens as part of our national support system. So some observations, and again, just for yourselves, it might give you an idea to compare to your own countries. I suppose several of our universities have twice the funding uh, under FP7 that they had under the previous programme, and they're looking for another doubling of that level of funding in the new programme. So it gives you a feeling for what they're, they're trying to achieve. We have a range of participants who have targeted activities where they're looking for over a million euros of funding in one participation. They're always people who are of interest to us because they're the people who use the programme to change their agenda, to uh, change their strategies because they're winning bigger parts of the funding and they're bringing in bigger <laughs> corporations, for example, with them. Another point that I would make very strongly is that in Ireland, we see a similar success rate for our companies uh, as that we see with our universities. 
So yes, the companies can do it. Our use of the Research for the Benefit of SMEs programme is one of our highlights. It's, tar it's been targeted to SMEs and it's one that we've used very carefully uh, and very well. And I suppose another point coming back to uh, Wolfgang's presentation, we're beginning to see the results coming out the other end of the projects. And of course, for us, we want the planning to go in up front to aim for commercialisation of what's coming out the other end of these projects. Uh, it's something that every country needs to work through. You win some, you lose some, but it's how can you optimise that uh, impact, that outcome of the projects. And if you want to compare yourselves, how does a country like Ireland uh, compare to countries like yours? We typically compare ourselves to Finland, Denmark, Austria. They'd be the countries that are you know, closest to us in size and have science, technology and innovation systems that are older than ours. They're more mature than ours. And often we're aspiring in a very young research system to grow to be as strong as we see uh, their activities. But we currently see when we population adjust the figures for these countries that we're right up there with these countries. We're chasing their tails, essentially. Uh, we've grown the activity and we're in a very strong position. I made the point about the UK. Again, I would say the UK, a very large country. Uh, when we population adjust the figures, it would put Ireland as ahead of the UK. But I think you can see with the UK that you'd have hot spots of very high activity and other areas of uh, big variability. So I suppose in terms of the future, what are we thinking about from the national perspective? I suppose nowadays uh, it's business as usual for the framework programme. Uh, we're trying to make sure that our researchers, our companies don't forget that there are still opportunities right through to year end. But our focus has really shifted to Horizon 2020. We're planning for it. Uh, we're positioning Ireland very carefully for success. We're aiming very much to leverage the national investments in research in our industries. And behind that, we're providing that quality support system that helps people to actually use the programme very effectively. That's our type of schedule. Uh, we're looking at work programmes where we have the opportunity we're aiming uh, to be ready the minute that legislation is adopted, the minute that budget is adopted and ready. But already our project teams are forming. Already our researchers and our companies are out there making connections, uh, interacting with European partners to be ready for the first call launches if they come through, as we hope they come through, on January the 1st next year. So that's it, uh, a feeling for a national perspective, and I'll answer any questions later. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Melda, and for sharing with the Irish experience. I mean, it's, it's very obvious you're doing great work there, and certainly targeting, um, targeting this initiative very well. I'd say compliments all around. You've done a great job there. Um, our final speaker of this session is Dr. Mazar Barry, another success story of an Irish company. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, amongst such esteemed people. Um, I will tell you the story of Solarprint. Solarprint is an Irish startup technology company. It was established in November 2008. Um, if I look back, my experience with the European projects goes back to 1992 or 93. So I've been involved in European projects for, over, for 20 years now, when I was a PhD student um, through my life in academia, and then now in the last five or six years um, in industry and, and SME research environments. So I have a bit of experience um, in this area, uh, which I can share with you um, today. Ah, this actually is the old presentation, but, but, but not to worry. Um, so what does SolarPrint do? SolarPrint um, produces um, advanced solar cell technology, and um, of course everybody here knows solar. Solar works outdoors when there's plenty of sunshine. In SolarPrint we produce a technology which actually works indoors from artificial light. So it produces power or energy harvesting from indoor light to power things like wireless devices. As you know, we now live in a world where everybody has wireless devices, and the number of wireless devices is going to grow exponentially 
you know, from million, hundreds of millions to probably billions over the next few years. And all these wireless devices require power, okay? And um, in solar print, we produce the most efficient technology in the world, probably, for energy harvesting to power some of these wireless devices. Um, in, the global air, in the global area of solar energy, there are different types of solar energies. There's um, generation one, which is the typical silicon that you see all around you. Generation two is thin film technologies. And generation three is what we call organic photovoltaics, or else dye solar cells, DSSC. So this is what solar print is developing, DSSC, dye solar cell technology. What's interesting at the moment in the world is, as you know, China has really overtaken the world in solar technology, generation one, and perhaps generation two in the next few years. So um, in Europe, there was a, a thriving solar industry in Germany that has now evaporated, or almost diminished now. So I think in Europe, we have to focus on what we call new niche applications and third generation photovoltaic technologies, which are based on advanced nanomaterials and novel manufacturing processes. So solar print is um, developing solutions for energy harvesting, for wireless sensors and devices. And these are the kind of application areas that we're focused on. Um, actually, this picture is quite old. It's actually the wrong presentation, but anyway. It's, um, so r really, I mean, our focus is to power wireless devices, such as wireless sensors. If you know in buildings, buildings consume 40% of the world's energy. So if you want to uh, make buildings more energy efficient, you, to make them smart, you install sensors. And sensors, of course, need power. I mean, what do you sense? Temperature, humidity, CO2, gas, movement. Um, so if you want to make buildings smart, you need to be able to quickly deploy wireless sensors. And they need power. So, so, so our technology provides a lot of power from indoor light, and that makes the building smarter. And therefore, you can reduce the energy consumption in a building by up to 50%. So this is one of the key applications. The other um, key application area space is um, next time you go to your local supermarket, you have a price tag. That price tag is typically on paper, it's printed. Um, the, the next step now is to make that electronic. So you need, to dis uh, you need to have a display to which you can communicate information wirelessly so you can have dynamic pricing. So the retailer is able to change the pricing on the electronic price tag. And um, so when you go to buy your tin of beans or whatever, it'll tell you if there's a special offer or not, share, uh, and share communication with you. Of course, that device needs power. And supermarkets do not want to use batteries or, or wiring in the shelving. So we provide an energy harvesting solution for that application. And this will be deployed in the next few months in a, uh, in a retail store in Austria um, later this year. The third area of application is in, your, in the hotel where you're staying tonight. I don't know where you are, but I mean, um, the door lock system has a wireless swipe card, right? So, um, so that mechanism, when you open your hotel door, um, that wireless lock, that, that lock mechanism needs power. So it's probably wired at the moment, or it needs batteries. So, this, so we work with one of the largest companies in the world, based in Sweden, who make these um, door lock systems, and they want to make that completely wireless and self-contained. So our energy harvesting solution provides the power <coughs> to enable that to happen. So these are just three different applications, and there, there are many, many more. In terms of um, our experience in FP7 projects, SmartTop, Molsol, and ENIAC, each one has a particular um, focus for us in SolarPrint. So in SolarPrint, like it, we're, we're a very knowledge-intensive SME. We do research and development, product development, production, and then commercial or market engagements. So each one of those four areas, we try to choose projects which helps the company um, to move forward. So SmartTop is a very interesting project. It's, um, the, the lead coordinator is Fiat, based in Italy. And the idea is to develop a new smart roof top for a car based on our technology, dye solar cell technology. Dye solar cells have a unique feature that they harvest a lot of energy from low light or cloudy conditions. So it gives more power than your standard silicon and PV cell. So here, this is a very interesting project. And we managed to put together key partners who are all responsible for their own part in the whole value chain to enable a product to be made. So from the, the universities doing the basic R&D to solar print providing the cells, people like Webasto and Adatel, who therefore provide the integration into the car and Fiat as the end user. So this is a very nice project where we managed to put together a consortia which takes into account all parts of the value chain in order to deliver a final product. 
So this is a very nice project. Molsol is a, more of a, as a project, three-year project, for um, under the future emerging technology for energy applications, the FET call, and this is um, looking at carbon, new carbon-based molecular wiring for solar cells. So this is a, a sort of a next-generation solar cell technology, and here we're working with IMEC in Belgium, at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and also the EPFL in Lausanne as well. So some, re some really interesting partners, and um, so, so we're also playing a role in that project. The last one, the other one is the ERG. This is part of the ENIAC joint pr project. And here we're working with, um, this is led by ST Microelectronics. And here the whole focus is around um, smart indoor environments and wireless sensors. Um, so, we're, so that's more, so the, in this project, we, many of the end users of our technology are involved. So this is very useful as well. Um, so you can see how we map out those different projects on our technology roadmap. Um, the ANYAC is around wireless sensors, smart top is for, for future applications for rooftops in cars, and Molsol is um, around fundamental research to um, improve the power performance or efficiency of the solar cells. Um, there was another one that we won last year called, it was an FP7 SME call, called Adius Roo to develop next generation dyes and electrolytes for our solar cells. And that was um, one that we failed to get the first time around but we won the second time, and um, that's a very useful project. In fact, I mean, out of 250 applications, we ranked number four. So it was a good, quali high quality um, project, and that started last year, and, th and that's actually working very well. As you know, in these European projects, you want to work with the best partners you can find in Europe to deliver a meaningful solution um, for, um, for industry or for SMEs. Um, yeah, so these are some of the ones, as, as Melda was saying, there are some good winners and some losers as well. So we, have, um, we, we don't win all our projects, and, um, but certainly the ones we do win, um, they're, they're, they're probably the best ones. Our experience, um, for SMEs it takes a lot of effort and time to, submit, to prepare and submit proposals. So we prefer not to be the lead or the coordinator in the projects. It's always good to, to make sure you have a, a coordinator who has a lot of experience in pulling together and working with many, pro, um, many different parties. So, so that's very useful. So the benefits of these projects are manifold. Number one, it gives us money, access to um, um, finance. Number two, there's um, access to a technical network of um, universities and companies. So we have access to world-class research partners. And of course, the commercial network is also important. We, it's an opportunity for us to work directly with our customers to jointly develop new products and applications. And of course, at the same time, it's also great validation of our technology and products as well with some of these customers. Now, of course, for an SME, one of the key things is the IP or intellectual property, which we value very much. Um, so as part of the FP7 SME call, one very nice feature of this project is that uh, the EU gives the money to the company to disimburse to the academic partners, but we own the IP. So that actually is a very nice project um, or, or, or system that works very well. So some of the cons or some of the um, things which are not good in, um, from our experiences, um, the bidding and the tendering for these projects is very resource, happy, very resource heavy. And, and Wolfgang, as we were saying earlier, the time from the, idea, from the time when you have the idea to actually starting the project, it can take up to a year. So actually, that's, that, that's a long time. And often in a small company, things move very fast. And um, what's, what was a good idea and the problem you wanted to solve after a year, you may have solved that problem already. So, so there's a problem there. Um, so therefore, we always try to focus on long-term research projects um, based on our um, technology roadmap. And um, that's that. Um, our experience, if you want to have a successful bid, to, um, it's important to pick your partners wisely, um, what I call backing a winning horse. So if you work with partners or companies or organizations which have a good track record in winning European proposals, well, work with those guys because they have a good system of, of understanding how to make the best bids. And of course, before the calls are even announced, people who have certain ideas or concepts start to form consortia before the calls are released. Um, it's important that you don't get involved in too many projects either. Um, I think last year we were, we, we were involved in I think seven or eight different projects. And what I find is if you're involved in too many, your chance of success actually is less. It's better to focus on a few good pro projects that you actually want to win and focus your effort on those. 
and this, this point is very important to him. We find working with Enterprise Ireland is very useful in terms of um, getting a bit of insight and know-how, how to um, write a winning proposal, how to get feedback, um, and so this is very, very useful for us. Um, for, for SMEs, it's important that you don't promise too much in, in the proposal. There's always, there's always a challenge, that you, there's always a risk that you promise too much or that you do promise re, re, to take activity which isn't really part of the main activity or focus of the SME. That can be a problem. So it's always very important to do, to do activity which is in line with the research priorities in the company or the SME. That, that, that's, um, that's very important. And keep the researchers happy. That's, that's critical. So thank you very much. Thanks for that. Uh, good understanding of A of your company, but B how the process of has also worked for yourself and your advice to us all of how to tap into it and uh, certainly advice we can pass on and try to learn from your experience now to see how we can change and adapt that as well and that might feed into some of the questions now as well. So our first, uh, we have, uh, we have, we'll take four questions first of all, of our speakers here. So our first uh, questioner is uh, Baroness O'Cahan um, from the United Kingdom. Thank you very much indeed. The presentations in this session have been as well throughout the the meeting would be terrific, but this has been particularly encouraging for people from the UK, um, where we've been battling with some of the problems that obviously you've battled with and seem to be very successful in battling with them. Uh, it's very important that we should get Horizon 2020 fixed now, as soon as possible. I mean, the delay is really not good for the researchers and it's not good for the EU. And all the time, our competitors internationally, like China, are making great headway. So I think we've got to you know, pull together and try and find some way of cutting the, the delaying tactics, or at least getting the European Parliament to, to agree this one. Secondly, just as a point of interest, the figure for business participants in the EU um, R and I programs is currently less than half that in, of education institutions. Uh, we've got something like 61% uh, of our success has been with higher education units and only 24% of business. So that's quite a different uh, result than other people, I think. The third point I would like to make is that the competitive position of the European Union in research and innovation has got to be maintained and indeed increased because China has already been mentioned and is already the second largest investor in research and development. But let us know but what we need to do, and I think this has been hinted at, but not actually specifically, the biggest problem is to ensure that we're not uh, we're swamped by regulation. For example, it already has been mentioned for the timed grant which uh, in the European Union can be as long as 499 days. In fact, that is an average in some of the bigger projects. Whereas in the US, and these are the DARPA figures that we managed to dig out only a couple of weeks ago, it's 150 days. Well, the idea that we should have just a third, at least they have a third of the time that we have to wait. So, and finally, I'd like to say that um, our committee in the House of Lords is tomorrow producing a report called the effectiveness of EU research and innovation proposals. That's a plug, and it also shows that we have a commitment to it also. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Baroness. If you want to give us a sneak preview of the, of the report, you can. But uh, we, might, we might get a copy of it after. I might organise a link up. So thanks for that. Um, our second questioner is uh, our colleague from, from Greece, uh, Konstantinopoulos, uh, Mr. Konstantinopoulos. Thank you, Mr. President. Promoting the entrepreneurship and especially innovative business opportunities, which will contribute towards transforming the country's growth model, as well as supporting the population parts mostly affected, such as young people and women in the basic priority for policies in order to support and foster innovative small and medium enterprises. Currently in Greece, about 20 new promising enterprises have started up with new innovative, inspired and extravagant businesses. This turned towards enterprise through innovation and especially the one concerning youths. It's obvious 
by the positive response to the operation of the Startup Greece internet platform, having already 5,000 members and aiming at networking and informing active and potential businessmen. Finally, we wish to underline that this kind of entrepreneurship is principally based on these new businessmen's knowledge, skills, enthusiasm, and imagination. I believe in these young people's abilities and capabilities, and in their will to conquer the markets, not with funds, but with foundation. Thus, we witness the introduction and the presence of small, unknown Greek businesses abroad with good, remarkable exports. It is our duty to trust this new generation and provide our youths with the opportunities needed to create and prosper. There is no other way. We shall have to move to this direction and in this spirit, both at a European Union level and at a national level, uh, state level, having faith in the healthy and creative forces of our society. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, a short question is from our colleague from the French National Assembly, Mr. Francois Brotez. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to congratulate you for the quality of the speakers this afternoon, all three. So, I wanted to have a question and answer session. It helps to have questions. So, what about prototypes and demonstration projects? We know that when research is concluded, you then have to move on to industrial scale and in production level, and that can be very expensive. But we know continents such as China and the U.S. put a lot of money aside for demonstration projects and scaling up. So perhaps Europe should move in this direction. But perhaps you would need royalties in return for Europe when they have financed these prototypes. Uh, th thanks for that. You raised a, a very important point because that's also an issue that comes across our desk quite a lot, is the, the next step and the funding to go to the next level. So thanks for raising the issue. Uh, our fourth question is from um, Ms. Anna uh, Ponis from Montenegro. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, great, thank you. Uh, well, since this is our last session, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, the organizers, for this great meeting, and of course, our chairpersons, uh, Mr. English and uh, Mrs. Taffy, for being uh, great hosts uh, these two days. Uh, I would like to uh, speak shortly about um, the potential in Europe uh, and uh, that it can be achieved through uh, green growth, which, which means that uh, we can uh, do it through investment in innovation, new technologies and support uh, of SME's development, but also by creating uh, green jobs. We believe that uh, this is an important potential for both uh, European countries and Montenegro as well. And uh, at the moment, there are more than 2.3 million uh, persons employed in uh, green jobs uh, worldwide. Um, also, green jobs in the uh, EU have been uh, growing as well. And uh, having in mind that a large number of unemployed people uh, there is in uh, Montenegro, around 20%, uh, and also a high percentage of imported energy, which is uh, more than 30%. Uh, we now know that uh, we must uh, put our focus on technologies made at home, and uh, these technologies should offer a large potential for employment and reduce dependability on uh, import of energy as well. Um, so in Montenegro, specifically, green jobs uh, can be created in uh, energy efficiency in construction, uh, sun energy, heating, biomass, and the wind, uh, wind uh, energy. Uh, however, um, green jobs are a large potential and resource for the future employment policy as well. And if they are supported by, as Minister Burton said uh, in the first session, uh, career guidance and education policy as well. So both economy and workers uh, can reap the benefits of green uh, jobs. And 
the green economy should be sustainable in two ways, uh, for the environment itself and of course for innovation, for employment and for rebuilding the economy uh, in the European uh, countries uh, as well as uh, in Montenegro. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, we'll turn to our top table now and we'll turn to Amelda first. Let me get some answers if that's okay. I'm not sure there are answers <laughs> particularly, but some, some comments, I guess. Um, I think maybe going back to one of the earliest points around the, the real issue of time to grant, and Mazar might, might come in again on that as well. I mean, um, for us, I suppose we have uh, two populations in this country. We have the people who can routinely use framework programs and they can deal with this issue of the time to grant. They tend to be maybe in academic institutions or uh, in some kind of an environment where they can do that. And then we have the other population where this is a huge issue. Uh, it really is having a negative effect on what they can do through the program. And of course, for us nationally, we want as many people to use the programme for as much of their business as they can, not just for very specific selected pieces that work for them. So uh, from a national perspective, it's anything we can do that uh, assists that and makes it shorter. Um, uh, and I think particularly the sort of comparison US versus EU, uh, it's something uh, I think we're all well aware of. It's how, how on earth do we get from where we are to, to something better. Um, uh, another one I think uh, I'd like to just pick up on or to comment on was uh, the move towards uh, demonstration, uh, the move towards prototypes. And I guess that's an interesting one for us. We've seen the move to include demonstration. And for example, we've seen it in the program Research for the Benefit of SMEs, where there's now a full demonstration uh, activity as part of that. And we really welcome that. Uh, we've had a whole range of proposals going in there and we're hoping to use it very uh, avidly, I would say. One point I would make about it while the Commission is moving towards uh, that model of funding more of that, these activities, we saw little difference in the application process to what you would see for the normal everyday research and development activities. And I suppose for us, that's an interesting one that if it's a move towards the funding of demonstration, uh, the funding of innovation, uh, the types of parts of the business that are closer to SBIR type models, we would expect to see a very different uh, type of proposal going in, something that's much more of a business plan uh, suited to the next business needs. But yet we seem to have a situation where there's a fallback to the standard proposal type format written in the same ways. So may maybe there's a little bit of room for improvement there. Um, maybe I'll leave it at that. I'll just pick up a few points from some of the different um, speakers. Um, regarding young people, I mean, I, I, when I came in, in this morning at 11, I mean, that's a very important point. In solar print, one tradition that we do have um, from, from very early on was to um, have interns coming to the company. So over the last four or five years, I think we've, we've had about 24 interns coming from different parts of Europe to spend three months, six months in the company. Um, and, and that's a very, very, um, it's a good experience for, for us in the company. We get a lot of value from very talented young people. And I think it's a good experience for them as well to experience a real startup or technology environment.